Welcome back to Talking Foreign Policy. I'm your host, Michael Scharf, Acting Dean of Case Western Reserve University School of Law. In today's broadcast, we'll be discussing the topic of cyber war. We'll begin our discussion with Peter Singer, Director of the Center for 21st Century Security and Intelligence at the Brookings Institution. Oxford University recently published Peter's new book on cyber war and cybersecurity. I just finished reading it, and it's an eye-opener. Peter, thanks for being with us today. Thank you. So, Peter, we hear so much about cyber threats and cyber war in the news. Where do we stand now? It's interesting, this, this topic of cybersecurity and cyber war, it connects issues that are as personal as your privacy or your bank account to as weighty as the future of world politics. And you know where we stand is that we are definitely in a age of huge uh, cyber dependence. You know everything from our uh, communications, our commerce, um, our infrastructure, and yes, conflict. Ninety-eight I mean, percent of U.S. military communications runs over the civilian-owned and operated internet. So we all depend on this. We live in a in a digital world, and yet we're also in an era of cyber insecurity. Uh, you can see it in everything from the 97% of Fortune 500 companies that have been hacked and 3% uh, you know, who just don't know it yet, uh, to there have been created over 100 different cyber military command equivalents around the world. Uh, to There was a poll taken, the first poll of 2014 by Pew, found that Americans are more afraid of a cyber attack than they are of Iranian or North Korean nuclear weapons or the rise of China or authoritarian Russia or climate change. So we've got this combination of uh, massive use of the online world and its rippling effect into the real world via, via the Internet of Things, but also we're not in a good place uh, in, in terms of our discomfort and, frankly, our, our lack of awareness on just the, the basics of this topic. And that was the point of the book is to try and connect those two together. And I suppose there's a spectrum. You know, on the one side, we've got the hacking like you were talking about and then maybe surveillance. But on the other side is this concept of cyber war, which you also devote several chapters to. How is this cyber warfare different from conventional war? You hit it exactly. And, and part of the problem of how we've approached it is we lump together so many different things simply because they take place in the realm of zeros and ones. Uh, so you know, a good illustration of this would be how General Alexander, who's the um, in charge of both cyber command and the National Security Agency, which you know you would you would never see that with other military commands and intelligence agencies, but because it's in this, we do. But he testified to Congress that uh, each day in his quote was that the U.S. military faces millions of cyber attacks. But to get that number of millions, he was combining you know everything from address scans and probes to attempts at pranks to attempts at political protests to attempts to get inside the network to do data theft or to do espionage. But none of um, what happened in terms of these millions of attacks was actually what people think of when they think of cyber war and what they should think of cyber war, which is um, you know a state of armed conflict, politically motivated, with violent, uh, with with violence, uh, it's just like with with regular conflict, with regular warfare itself, um, you know, and you can see this in the phraseologies of you know a cyber 9/11 or a cyber Pearl mm-hmm. Harbor. So we mush lots of things together. You know, I, I make the parallel that it's a lot like saying that a um, te- group of teenagers with firecrackers, a um, group of political protesters in the street with a smoke bomb a um, James Bond spy with his pistol, a terrorist with a roadside bomb, and a um, military with a cruise missile and saying, well, these are all the same because they involve the chemistry of gunpowder. Well, no, you know, they're not, and we wouldn't treat them that way, but we do here. So with cyber warfare, it's uh, definitely, um, you know, part of why it's important to distinguish what we mean when we say war is it also allows you to get to the true reality of it when you're talking about how the military actually uses this technology and the nature of the beast when you're exploring things like computer network operations and the like. Right. And you mentioned we, the United States, now has a cyber command. Uh, it's not just the sea, the land, the air, and outer space anymore. Now we also have an entire military apparatus for cyberspace. 
But surely, Peter, they're not looking at the the firecrackers and the little teeny things. They're they're preparing for all out war, right? That question of mission and responsibility has been um, one of the areas that's bedeviled uh, the approach to this space because um, how uh, when you talk about jurisdictions, when you talk about national borders, it gets very fuzzy when you move into the online world. You also have uh, an issue of scale. Um, it'd be surprising to a lot of people, but there's actually more uh, folks working in the Fort Meade complex, which is where Cyber Command and NSA are. There's more people working in that than there are in the Pentagon itself. Wow. Um, this is a huge growth area. And how much and, money and are again, they spending on that? There's a lot of different ways to cut it. Um, to me, what stands out is not the exact amount that you're spending, but how you're um, dividing up your resources. And uh, in the U.S., we spend about 10 times as much on the governmental side on um, Defense Department uh, cyber operations um, as we do in the Department of Homeland Security on the on the civilian mm-hmm. side. Um, it also, if you want to, you know, what are you spending on internally? Research and development, we're spending, again, depending on who's, how you're, you're categorizing it, but roughly we're spending two and a half times to four times as much on cyber offense research and development as we are cyber defense research and development, which is, um, I don't think, uh, I argue that that's, that's not the most strategic approach. Uh, it's a lot like, you know, you, you talked about those teenagers. Well, if you're using a metaphor, it's a lot like being worried about gangs of roving teenagers in your neighborhood and you're standing there in your glass house and you say, you know what, I ought to go buy a stone sharpening kit. Well, some people do say that a good defense is a strong offense, but I want to go back no, to the be- a actually in, in, in both sports and in warfare, the best defense is a good, a good defense. defense. <laughs> Certainly with the Super Bowl coming up, that's true. Let me ask you this. So you mentioned that people are talking about a cyber Pearl Harbor or a cyber 9-11. What are the, the possible major consequences that we could see from a cyber attack? What, what's the worst case scenario that you can imagine? So first, let's, you know, let's caveat all of this by staying within the reality of the real world of what's happening right now before we get to kind of the potentiality. So, you know, as, despite the fact that there's been over a half million references in the media and academic journals uh, to a cyber 9-11 or a cyber Pearl Harbor, or the fact that there's been 31,000 magazine and academic journal articles about the phenomena of cyber terrorism. Let's be fundamentally clear that uh, no person has been hurt or killed ever uh, so far by cyber terrorism, by the FBI definition of it. Um, if we want to talk about the power grid going down scenario, squirrels have taken down the power grid more times than the zero times that hackers have. So that's where we are right now. If we want to talk about the actual now playing out big national security issues, to me, the real world one to worry about is the massive campaign of intellectual property theft that's emanating from primarily China. It's the largest theft in all of human history that's going on. And it has huge consequence, not just for um, the economy, but for national security in the end. Uh, now, if you want to go to the, the what ifs, you know, what could be the, the danger? In the last part of the book, we, we explore sort of the key trends that are moving forward. And it's the combination of one thing that's happening with the Internet more broadly and one that's happening within cyber warfare. With the Internet more broadly, it's the shift to the Internet of Things, where we're not just using um, Internet-enabled devices to communicate with one another, you know, I um, email you or whatnot, but it's devices that range from our cars to our thermostats to our power grid, um, our refrigerators, all being looped in. And so now you've got the real world being connected. And we're doing that for reasons of efficiency, um, for gains in the environment, all sorts of good things out of it. But it also means that there's vulnerabilities there that can be tapped with greater consequence. Um, We've already seen car hacking. We've already seen Mm refrigerator hacking. But then the second is the development of new cyber weapons. And Stuxnet is the, the, the game changer here where it's a weapon 
that in one hand, it's like every other weapon in history. It, it causes a, a physical change in the world, you know, like a stone did or a drone does. But the difference is, is that it's made of zeros and ones. So this, digital is the, and software. this is what the United States and Israel used against the Iranian nuclear reactors, right? It went after um, Iranian nuclear research. Uh, in particular, they were um, operating under a, a SCADA system to control things like the centrifuges and the like. And it, it damaged both what they were working on and also the systems themselves. And it's it's a fascinating story you know, we cover in the book on, in a lot of different ways. One of showing this this new kind of weapon of you know causing physical damage through digital means. Um, it's interesting in that it's a weapon that was, you know, here, there, and everywhere. Uh, it was in 25,000 plus different computers around the world. On the other hand, it might have been the first ethical weapon ever created in that it could, it may have been in all these different computers, but it could only cause damage to the one target that it was intended to. So even if you had the very same brand centrifuges, you know, in your basement aligned in the exact same way, it still wouldn't have worked on those. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's fascinating in a lot of different ways, but it's also you know, one person we, we um, interview in the book described it as, you know, Pandora's box. It, it, it opened up a, a whole new set. And, this, and so that combination of, you know, to, to your question of now you can not just cause physical damage, but you now have more targets of greater consequence that systems like that can go after. And theoretically, that could be used against satellites. It could be used against our aviation. It, it could really cause physical damage by SCADA down. is used in everything from, um, you know, nuclear research. SCADA, the, 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 right. the system that it was going after. Uh, everything from nuclear research to uh, traffic signals to um, factories that make anything from jet fighters to uh, cupcake wrappers. Uh, and so, you know, the, the issue here, again, is our, all the gains that we've gotten out of digitizing systems, but that brings with it vulnerabilities. The key, though, is you can't um, delude yourself into thinking that you can protect yourself somehow by disconnecting. You know, some people say, oh, well, uh, you know, I may be using this digital system, but it's not linked to the internet. So uh, if, and sometimes if that's it's not, called air gapping. If that's not the solution. So what exactly is the United States, this new cyber command doing to try to protect us from this threat? So cyber command, you know, one of the things that's playing out right now is this question of what exactly are its responsibilities. So originally when it was created, uh, Defense Department officials talked about how it would just be responsible for defending Defense Department networks. Like any other organization, um, you know, again, whether you're talking about militaries or the March of Dimes, it slowly but surely, or actually in this case, fastly, uh, took on a, a wide variety of different roles. So it's um, both uh, protecting Defense Department systems. It's then set up a series of units that are designed to um, basically be operative in, in cyber war. So they're, they're able to be tasked out to the regional commands and the like. Then there's another part that's about um, national uh, protection, and there's units that are basically designed to aid in the defense of not exclusively Defense Department networks, but other critical infrastructure out there and the like. And so this is when you get into the interesting things of um, legal authorities and budgets and responsibilities. One of my concerns is that it's, it's quite natural to to when you're talking about threats to say, well, why shouldn't the military uh, be responsible for defending us? But the problem here is that it um, it causes a sh a, a, sh a shift in and it causes a sort of sense of complacency and a, and a, um, it mm -hmm. takes away the responsibility you should have. So th think about it this way: you'll sometimes see, hear um, people cite uh, incidents where a group um, might have done a denial of service on uh, banks. Uh, there was an incident where a general talked about that as you know why we needed more funding for cyber command. If there was a bank that was moving cash to another bank in a armored van and a bunch of protesters stood in the street and they blocked it for two hours and then they dissipated, no one would say, oh my goodness, where was the U.S. military? Mm -hmm. But change that bank and that money to zeros and ones and that's the narrative that we have right now. No, it's, it's also the responsibility of the banks and the like. 
Well, now that's an interesting insight. And we'll discuss this in greater detail when we come back from a short break. We've been talking to Peter Singer, best-selling author of the book Cybersecurity and Cyber War. When we come back, we're going to bring three leading experts into the discussion to look at the practical, ethical, and legal aspects of cyber warfare. Stay with us. Welcome back to Talking Foreign Policy, brought to you by Case Western Reserve University and WCPN 90.3 Ideastream. I'm Michael Scharf, Acting Dean of Case Western Reserve University School of Law. We're talking today about cyber war with Peter Singer of the Brookings Institute, Colonel Mike Newton of Vanderbilt, Professor Milena Stereo of Cleveland Marshall College of Law, and Dr. Shannon French from Case Western's Inamori Center. Just before the break, Peter Singer was telling us about the U.S. approach to cyber war. There were some offensive and perhaps not enough defensive components. But let's now begin this segment with our military expert, Vanderbilt professor and former JAG colonel Mike Newton. Mike, is it fair to characterize the situation that's going on between countries in the world of cyber weapons as a kind of arms race? I guess in a sense it is, uh, but it's a different kind of arm. It's really a race for technological supremacy, and so, you know, the real challenge is the same thing we've had since the invention of the crossbow. How does the law respond? How does national policy respond? Uh, the challenges are to our classic conception of what we really mean by war. What does it mean to wage war? Uh, and this represents a whole new set of actors that are involved in that, and, and Peter quite correctly points out there's this incredibly a vast combination of private actors, public actors, uh, government infrastructure, uh, persons acting under, under government influence or to, in their minds, to help achieve government purposes. So it's a, a very difficult legal conceptual fit to simply take the established law of war and, and cram it down onto, onto the context of cyber war. Now, Mike, you mentioned that it's really about technology evolving, and this happens all the time. But this reminds me of more of a technological leap like the nuclear age. And let me bring Shannon, who is an ethicist, into the conversation here. <laughs> Policymakers didn't really understand nuclear weapons, so they let the scientists and the military specialists do all sorts of Dr. Strangelove-like experiments, <laughs> some of which I think brought us very close to losing the ozone layer. Um, do you see any parallels to what's going on with the exploration of new weapons and means of warfare in cyberspace? Well, I, I will first say something I hope reassuring, which is I think we do have better communication going on now in terms of policymakers actually seeking out genuine experts and um, getting uh, input from them. And I would also say that, that although it is a little bit confusing to many of us. A lot of the world uh, that is this new cyber realm can be translated better than a lot of the, the nuclear science uh, in terms of, again, speaking directly to policymakers. But I actually think what's interesting is there are some strong parallels to what we saw in the Cold War with the arms race and the uh, so-called MAD uh, strategy, which was mutually assured destruction, uh, in the same way um, that major powers decided, well, we really can't nuke one another because everybody loses. You see the same kind of implicit restraint going on uh, with the use of um, major cyber attacks with the major powers because it doesn't make sense. We are too interconnected, especially economically, for uh, us to attack one another. So again, it is parallel in that just like in that era, we have now the greater worry being rogue groups. It isn't that we're worried about the major powers attacking one another with their strengths. We're worried about it more on the level of asymmetric threats. But what about China? I read in the news that it's China that's pouring all the money in other than us into this area. Peter, can you tell us what your take is on that? Well, there's a couple of things. The first is um, the you asked about arms races. Mm -hmm. And one of the other attributes of every arms race in history is that you're driving forward for, for very good reason, for your security. That's why you're investing in these technologies and you're worried about real adversaries out there. And that, that's what drives the sides in an arms race. But the other hallmark of every single arms race is that the more you spend, the less you 
the less secure you end up feeling mm-hmm. in the end. And that's, you know, whether you're talking about the arms races of battleships back, you know, prior to World War One to the nuclear arms race to what we're seeing today on the cyber side. The other is that, um, and this is where I may disagree a little bit, is that there are some parallels to the Dr. Strange Lovian uh, thinking that that's out there. And you can see that, um, one, in some of the kind of hucksterism, uh, you know, people who understand uh, just a little bit about it or, or even more so stand to benefit from hyping a threat or some kind of silver bullet solution to it. Um, a lot of the, the discourse in Washington, D.C., you know, I joke, has the attributes of um, spinal tap, you know, turn the volume up to 11. Um, you can see that there, and, and, and that's of concern to me. Uh, the other part of it, and another example would be, you know, the, the solutions. Oh, well, let's just create a new, more secure Internet. No, you know, that that's just not going to happen. Um, but to your point about China, you know, again, I'm, I'm not saying uh, this is a, th- a purely a threat hyping problem. There are real issues at play here. There are real capabilities being built. We talked about the U.S. side, but China is just as active in building up its capabilities, both formally within its military, as well as a much wider uh, network that you can call, you know, a patriotic hacker community or militia community. The difference with, um, it's almost a a quality quantity aspect to it. Um, There's a description of the the Chinese approach towards um, internet censorship that's called the human flesh search engine and it has you know that's that's in many ways the the parallel here of china where it's just a on the on the on the attack side there's just a massive amount that's going on and the targets range from the military defense companies oil companies to small furniture makers in new england to universities and uh, even my think tank uh and you know again that's just the u.s and in the book we talk about um Operation Shady Rat, which was linked back to China, and it hit, you know, everything from international organizations that ranged from, you know, trade groups to the International Doping Agency prior to the the um, uh, Beijing Olympics to, you know, again, to Coca-Cola has been hit. I mean, it's just a massive scale, and that may be the differentiator here. Let me turn to the legal issue here and to start with something that Peter was telling us about earlier, and that is this Suxnet attack where the United States and Israel actually were able to do a cyber attack on these nuclear facilities that, I guess, put Iranian uh, construction of nuclear weaponry back about two years, as I understand it. So when the U.S. attacks another country like that, Milena, doesn't the president have to authorize an attack? Does he need congressional approval? How does this fit into our conventional thinking about warfare? Yeah, so under any kind of a conventional analysis of warfare, normally our president does need congressional authorization to deploy troops. Now, on the other hand, our president is the uh, has the inherent constitutional authority as our commander-in-chief to use force. And so the very difficult constitutional question is really then, under what circumstances can the president act alone without Congress? And I think most scholars would agree that the president can act alone if our nation is faced with some kind of a sudden threat. So there, to to bring it back to this issue of uh, cyber attacks against Iran, you would have to make the argument that the Iranian uh, uh, nuclear enrichment facilities were producing nuclear material at such a pace where they were about to reach this stage where they were about to produce a nuclear weapon, which then would be a sudden, you know, could be a sudden immediate threat to the United States. Under that rationale, then you could say, okay, our president can use force. But that also assumes that we're conceiving of a cyber attack by the United States as a conventional military attack. And I think that goes back so to what... if it's O's and ones, we shouldn't? Well, if it's O's and ones, it makes it a lot more difficult. This is what Mike Newton was also talking about earlier. Um, you know, if we're talking about sending a computer worm, you know, called Stuxnet over to Iran, which doesn't really require the deployment of U.S. troops, which is not going to kill anybody, which might slow down their production of uranium, but, you know, we're not talking about human lives. Can we really think of it the same way that we think of, for example, sending, you know, 10,000 American troops to Afghanistan. And I think... Well, what about... So we're talking about the U.S. constitutional view. What about the international view? If a country's borders are sacrosanct, they're supposed to have under the U.N. charter 
the right of inviability. Sure. And another country comes in but penetrates them not physically but with O's and ones over right. the internet, but but does damage to them that costs a lot of money right. and, and hits at their very national security. Is that a violation of international law? Right. So that kind of an act under international law could be viewed as aggression, which is really a use of force by one state against another state or a group of other states uh, that doesn't comply with the normal rules of international law, which which say basically you can use force only in self-defense or if the United Nations Security Council authorizes you to use force. So here I think you have to analyze the nature of the cyber attack. Is it just... Are the O's and ones, are they just, you know, are we just talking about slowing down a nuclear plant? Or are you also taking down an entire, you know, power grid? Are you talking about, you know, neutralizing an entire infrastructure, all of the defense missiles? You know, it really comes back to the scope, the nature of the attack, the cyber attack. And then I want to talk to Shannon about the ethical aspects of this. So let's say you're the expert who was tasked to launch the cyber attack. As an ethicist, what are your thoughts about the psychological and ethical implications on that person, on U.S. personnel who are engaged in cyber warfare acts? Well, as an ethicist, you always worry when there's distance and and potential detachment because every time uh, someone has to make a decision that has an impact on the lives of others, the harder it is for them to see and judge that impact, the less likely they are to, to make the uh, ethical choice and the more callous they're going to be. That is simply a consequence that, that we're familiar with. And it's interesting, we've actually talked about this on this program in a different context. There was a lot of worry about that with the drones uh, and actually discovered to some folks' surprise, including my own at one at one stage, uh, that uh, the drone operators were seeing their victims very close up and were actually experiencing high levels of PTSD and, and having to work through almost like a sniper um, what their relationship was to the people that they were targeting. But that wouldn't be true But that here. wouldn't be true. No. Yeah, that, that very uh, distance that people thought the drone operators would have, the cyber folks really could have. And so that, that maybe that worry needs Needs to be revived in this context. And you've said before, if you don't have skin in the game, you're likely to make mistakes. Right. right? But yeah. I do have to put a caveat in here, and this actually connects back to something that Peter said. I think we can't lose sight of the, the potential good here in terms of cyber weapons. Actually, I think he suggested they might be more ethical in some contexts, and I recognize that. If they are more precise, if they actually don't have the kind of collateral damage that we worry most about if they're not harming vulnerable populations. Right. So if our option yeah. was to do cruise missile strikes on the nuclear weapon facilities in Iran, and there were a lot of collateral damage of civilians. Mm -hmm. And instead, we just sent the O's and ones over right. the internet, and we accomplished the same thing. Well, yeah, that And maybe we sense. don't care how callously we feel about that if it's in fact in the real world saving an outcome that's lives. saving a lot of lives and including, again, vulnerable population lives. Well, let me then turn to Mike Newton. Mike, you've got a new book about proportionality in the laws of war. Oh, who, by the way, is the publisher of that? That would be Oxford University okay. Press, and it makes a great St. Patrick's Day present. <laughs> <laughs> so Oxford's got this uh, broadcast down. But let me ask you, if the harms caused by a cyber attack would sometimes rise to a physical level that might justify a conventional military response, is that possible? It's, it's theoretically possible, but this is the issue that Shannon was just edging up to. Uh, the entire corpus of the laws and customs of war uh, really is designed to regulate kinetic hostilities, uh, uh, to protect innocent civilians, to keep to keep the threat of humanity, even in the middle of, of intense armed conflict, uh, for all combatants and for all persons. So at some core, there's a fundamental recognition of, of basic human dignity and human rights. Uh, the problem is in cyber war that, that when you begin to talk about taking uh, O's and ones, as Peter correctly says, and using them to inflict real physical damage, um, and then talk about applying the laws and customs of war in response to that, that's a paradigm shift in response to the paradigm shift. Well, but let me, let, let me so, make this more concrete, Michael. What if the cyber attack by the United States didn't just damage the nuclear uh, research that was going on, but actually caused the nuclear reactor to blow up? Now what? Well, you've got two huge problems. One is the problem of causation. Was it caused by private actors, public actors, 
because of the basic law of war principle that all of your activities must be directed at all times against lawful combatants or the participants in the conflict. In the cyber context, it's enormously complex in real time to run that back and figure out exactly uh, in terms of causation. So what and happens the like in, in the Suxnet, Mike, uh, a couple months later, somebody leaked it out. I don't know if it was the Obama administration bragging about it or if it was someone who was unhappy about it that just leaked it. But these things do leak out. So let's say the U.S. does the attack on cyber space, it blows up a nuclear <laughs> reactor in Iran, and then it leaks out that it was the U.S. and not some non-state actor that was behind this. Then what? But, but that's one of the attractive beauties of cyber operations. It's designed not to blow up the nuclear reactor in Iran, and it didn't, in fact. There was no human being, no effect whatsoever. So it's a, it's a highly theoretical question. So you won't take Peter, the bait, Peter, huh? <laughs> well, Peter talked. Well, Peter talked about the responsibility of cyber command, and I think that's the key authority. So to the immediately as soon as you move into the military context you have got to articulate what is the mission statement what is the scope and from that the specified task precisely what is the military supposed to accomplish and the implied tasks are the things that are necessarily implied that have to happen in order to accomplish that all right so, so let me in the switch it around of cyber war that's yeah. very difficult if not impossible to do so mike let's switch it around let's say it was iran who does the cyber attack against the united states and there's maybe a nuclear reactor that blows up, right? Because you're, you're focusing on, well, the U.S. won't do this. But I'm just trying to get to the question of what if some country does it to another? Does that then equate to an armed attack? In theory, uh, yeah. If you cause uh, the, the, the legal languages uh, that the damage is of a scope and a magnitude and an intensity to equate to an armed attack. But the problem is, by definition, these are not armed attacks. They're cyber attacks. Um, or denial of services or, or uh, clogging of computer networks. It takes an incredibly, and in fact I would say it would be the worst cyber attack in history if it did actually unintentionally result in some physical damage. Peter, do you think that there would ever be a cyber attack from one country to another that would result in physical damage? Is this just a hypothetical or is this something that's perhaps possible and more even likely? Well, I mean, it's not a hypothetical because you've been talking about a real world case where it happened. I mean, Stuxnet was a cyber attack that resulted in physical damage. Now, it was what we would describe as an act of espionage, not war, but you know, you can get back and forth in that. That's a that's a, you know, reflecting kind of domestic legal concerns, but to your to your broader question of, you know, when does this when does a cyber attack become an act of war in the meaningful term of, oh, it just happened in cyber, but it means we've got to go to war? Mm -hmm. The reality is, um, so first, this is not always so clear um, when you're talking about, you know, regular uh, armed war warfare. So, you know, think about the example of, oh, well, if, if someone uh, fires a, 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 a weapon, a rifle or whatnot, at my nation, that's of course an act of war. Well, actually, no. We have you know border disputes all the time. Okay. Well, um, you know, a actions that have no weapons use can still be an act of war. You could, uh, for example, you know, if you uh, deliberately flooded um, your entire your neighbor's entire country, and it you know was a cascade mm -hmm. that caused you know thousands of lives to be lost no one would say well goodness there was no gunpowder there so it's not an act of war we judge it by the effects mm -hmm. um but in in the book you know where we, i, I kind of wrestle with this in the end there's this quote from a guy who puts it best is that in the end the president's going to decide and um that's you know we'll, 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 it comes down to a human judgment of when it's a war when it's a state of armed conflict when it's something else but it's it's a human decision the concern though to one of your prior points and where where it ties in with drones is not so much how the operators look at this but how the politicians look at it and whether you're talking about a drone or a cyber weapon it's very seductive to politicians mm -hmm. because it seemingly offers an effect without risk. But as we've seen with whether it's drones or cyber weapons like Stuxnet, what you often want to happen is not always the way it plays out, whether it's you know physical collateral damage or the fact that this covert operation leaked or the fact that it you know this weapon that was designed only to go after one target in the world 
popped up in 25,000 other right. computers around the world, which is not something that would happen with a regular bomb. Right. So it's just a complex space. Um, but, but again, to me, it's if we want to worry about the um, the human views of it, it's not so much the operator; it's us. It's it's the polit- the body politic and the politicians. So it's Michael, t- this is Mike. Yeah, Mike, we need to take clear- another uh, short break now, and then we'll start the conversation back in just a minute. Um, I love it when we can end and things are hot and heavy because that means the listeners will stay tuned. So we'll be right back. This is Michael Scharf, and we're back with Talking Foreign Policy. I'm joined today by Peter Singer in D.C., Mike Newton in Nashville, Shannon French and Melania Stereo are with me here at WCPN Ideastream in snowy Cleveland. We're talking about cyber war. Now, just before the break, uh, Mike Newton, our colonel from the JAG, wanted to jump in and, and add something. So, Mike, here's your chance. So I just want to really clarify very briefly, uh, one of the things that everybody is alluding to, but I want to say it very clearly in legal terms, that the big difference between uh, acts short of an all-out armed conflict in response to a cyber attack or in a cyber context is that the law actually only permits the actor to do what's strictly required, what's, what's narrowly tailored only to ameliorate the, the threat. Uh, that's the law of self-defense, the classic law of self-defense, the classic law of countermeasures, the classic law of embargo short of armed conflict. The point is that that rule and the legal construct and all of the other range of laws and customs of war changes dramatically once we recognize we're in the context of an armed conflict. That's why this distinction matters a great deal, uh, because in, in the cyber war context, it's easy to say we're only allowed to use that degree of force or cyber cyber technology necessary and narrowly tailored to strictly eliminate the threat. The problem is it's so incredibly difficult to ascertain precisely what that means in that context. And that's a great segue for what I wanted to talk about next, which is the question of how international law applies to the conduct of a cyber war. Let me begin with, Shannon, you've written books about this. What was it? The the last book, The, the, um, the Code, Code of, of the, the Warrior. Warrior. Yeah. Right. Is it possible to apply centuries-old criteria of just war tradition to something so new and different like cyber warfare, a a form of war made possible by advanced technology? Well, you know, this is a drumbeat of mine. This is uh, something that I, I try to get out there as much as possible. There is nothing new under the sun in the way that is relevant to changing the just war tradition. And what I mean by that is, of course, we have new technologies. Of course, we have new forms of weapon, weaponry. But the trick is not to then say, oh, my goodness, we must create a whole new theory of just war. It's to figure out how to apply these tried and true principles to these new advances. And, uh, you know, for example, we've already been alluding to many of them. The, the mm-hmm. core principles of just war, things like proportionality, discrimination, uh, right authority, all of that is still valid and true, and it hasn't changed just because we have this new way of doing it. And I would just like to emphasize again something that that, uh, Peter mentioned earlier. It is the job of the just war tradition uh, to try to limit the scope of war and also to hopefully seldom actually has succeeded at this, but actually limit the number of wars that we get ourselves into. And so anything that lowers the bar towards getting into a war is very worrisome ethically. Uh, and, and I would also add finally on this point that when we see uh, groups with greater technologies and especially world powers using them in a powerful way against weaker groups or groups that don't have the same technologies, Uh, That asymmetry can create new enemies as well. So where it may be appealing to a policymaker, we didn't put any boots on the ground. We may actually be leading to more deaths, more threat, because we are putting ourselves out there in a way that is going to make more people angry at us as a nation. And this is a theme that Peter makes in his book as well. Peter, do you want to elaborate on that? Well, a couple of things. The the first in complete agreement that you 
you shouldn't try. You see these discussions like, oh, we need to write a, a new Geneva Conventions for the cyber world. You know, one, that doesn't make sense. And two, it's just completely unworkable. Uh, and, and again, I'm in agreement with the, the idea of, you know, pull from the values that have been tried and true. We do need to understand, though, that there are um, new kinds of challenges that were never contemplated. You know, one is, um, so the idea of, you know, disaggregating the military versus the civilian makes perfect sense when you're, you're thinking about conventional weapons. But, you know, the Internet itself is civilian. It, it, so you will inherently be using, um, you know, you can't, uh, if the, if 98% of U.S. military communications go over the civilian owned and operated internet, you know, this is, it's, it's the mashing up of this already. Um, the other, and this is where, again, there's a cross with drones, is that the, um, it's not that there's no decision making, it's that the locus of decision making is now moving um, both geographically and now when you move into both autonomous robotics but also cyber weapons chronologically in ways that it's very difficult uh, for you know older laws to wrestle with I mean so Stuxnet was a weapon that so to speak was fired and its effect played out months later and so it's it's a, it's a really um, it's an interesting space there's a lot of challenges to it. Uh, but you know, I'm 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 the son of a of an army jag officer, and one of the things um, you know you can you can argue pretty much everything. There's this idea that the law is conclusive on something. No, that's you know th there's huge amounts of arguments on everything from the Geneva Conventions to you know what the Constitution says about everything from abortion to gun rights. This is a new manifestation of it. So when someone says this is legal or this is not, that's their interpretation of the law. Unfortunately, you know the real world is much more difficult to figure out. Shannon, did you want to add something? Well, I, I, I agree with, uh, with all of those points. I simply wanted to add that oftentimes the, the great difficulty but the important work to be done is to figure out what is the right analogy, that mm -hmm. if we have mm -hmm. seen mm -hmm. different kinds of weapons in the past and we have hopefully figured out how we ought to respond to them, how do we find the analogy with these new forces and then uh, use those laws correctly? Yeah, now I have to point out that not everybody agrees with the view that the current law is sufficient for this new threat. And if you go on the blogs, there are superstar experts in the field that are debating this issue. So let me turn to Melina. How would you make the argument that there needs to be a new cyber Geneva Convention? And what would be its essential provisions? Sure. So the Hague Law, the Geneva Conventions, the treaties that we have currently were written so long ago before nuclear weapons, before drones, and certainly before you know any kind of cyber weapons, that they really, the, the drafters never contemplated anything like what we're seeing today. Um, there is, I should mention, that there is a treaty called the Intervention, International Convention on Cybercrime, which was adopted in 2001 one by the Council of Europe, but that that convention really falls short of sort of detailing everything that you would want in a, in a comprehensive, you know, multilateral treaty. So some of the main points, Plus if it, you... its focus is, is low-level cyber attacks, exactly. not these giant things it's, that we're talking about it's as low warfare. It's le low-level yeah. cyber, cyber attacks and also encouraging member states to prosecute those at the national right. level. Right. So if you want to talk about a big multilateral treaty on cyber uh, war, cyber attacks, first you would want to carefully define you know, what is a cyber attack, what is cyber war, and then you might want to think about prohibiting certain types of cyber attacks, similarly to how certain types of attacks are prohibited under traditional conventions. So you might want to prohibit cyber attacks on things like hospitals, you know, infrastructure, um, airlines, things where you basically think that the civilian suffering is going to far outweigh whatever, you know, military objective you're trying to achieve. And, so, so and then that you would sense, basically say that any country that did that was the equivalent of someone who commits genocide or crimes against humanity, it's a violation of international law. They, their leaders could be potentially prosecuted. Exactly. So yeah. there, then, then you would want to somehow tie it into the existing international law and basically say, well, then that's an act of aggression, right? That's illegal under international law. And the leaders now face individual, you know, individual international criminal responsibility. So, Peter, you're against that approach. What do you think is the problem with it? What we push for in the book is the idea of grafting. And grafting is um, something that both studies in international relations have found uh, to be more effective in building international cooperation, um, but also it's taken from horticulture. And it's the idea that, you know, let's, let's just be blunt. Um, if you tried to create an entirely new Geneva Conventions right now, 
you'd never get any agreement on it and you would not get um, any ratification of it by the key states. You know, a good example in the cyber world is the um, uh, NATO asked a group of top really smart minds um, to come up with a manual for um, the legal side of cyber warfare, uh, the Talon Manual. And, and it's, a, it's a, you know, in many ways a great document, a lot of interesting stuff in it. And then what happened, the United States, a NATO member said, yeah, but we're not bound by that. Um, and so the point is that grafting, you know, it's instead of trying to plant a new tree, it's to build off of what already works effectively. Um, and so, you know, the example that was mentioned there would be uh, the cybercrime um, treaty that's, you know, there's some trying to bring new members in it. So you're, what I'm getting at is that I would love, you know, it's, it's, it's the idea of trying to combine legal thinking with real world politique and um that's that's the challenge of this space is that we need to not approach it in kind of siloed arguments from our own issue areas but understand you know uh what's possible or not possible both on the technical side and also on the political side and also on the legal side and bring them all together one last point that's sort of a fascinating one when um that illustrates the the kind of cool but crazy aspects of this space when we're an illustration of uh, the what we might want to build into a treaty that would not find its space in a in a um, traditional Geneva Conventions approach is you know when we say okay there's certain things we don't want to target and in, in regular national law it's you know shouldn't target civilians and there's really important things not to target among civilians like ambulances or churches or hospitals those are particularly don't go after those in cyber you know we typically say things like hospitals are like but the one that really matters the, uh, at a huge level that m most everyone would agree to is the financial system mm -hmm. the only nation that wouldn't be taken down by an attack on anyone's financial system because of the ripple effects would be north korea melina you wanted to add something. just a very quick note i mean I, I i definitely agree with peter that it would be extremely difficult and probably impossible as of now to negotiate a big multilateral treaty but an approach which would maybe fit under this uh the, the idea that peter is talking about is maybe to use soft law instruments to supplement mm -hmm. what we already have so it is much easier to negotiate you know codes of conduct guidelines think of that sort that can then supplement for example the the cyber convention that we already have and then the hope the goal would be that over time, if states then are using that kind of soft law, the guidelines, the codes of conduct, that maybe at some point will be closer to a customary norm of, of law. And it, as I understand it, the Talon oh. Manual that Peter mentioned is something of that sort. Exactly. Mike Newton, you've studied this. Are, do you have particular criticisms of any of the provisions of the manual? Oh, I think it's good. I agree with Peter to extend the horticultural uh, metaphor. You know, the fig leaf of law here is really no solution. You know, we feel really good. We've got a new convention. We've got some soft law. We've got some codes. Um, the problem is that, that we haven't really dealt with the relevant actors. I mean, the big, the big problem in the Talon Manual, as well as the ICRC uh, whole study about what, when does a civilian cross the threshold into legally participating in conflict mm -hmm. to the extent that they can be targeted, you know, the direct participation mm -hmm. study, is exactly the same thing. Discussions for close to a decade, and in the end, no real agreement. So I think the, the, this approach that says, well, we need more law is kind of quixotic. Um, I agree with Peter about the financial system. Uh, the other one that I would say that almost everybody would agree with ought not to be messed with uh, is the, the system that regulates transnational aviation flight. You know, how many flights around the world go down with all kinds of consequences? That's, a, that's kind of a no-brainer. Um, the problem is that all the things that we want to protect in a real all-out cyber war become the indirect uh, uh, victims of an all-out cyber war. And there's no real way in an all-out cyber war when you shut down the electric grid, at least theoretically, to control who that affects and how that affects. So that's the core problem to trying to reach any real uh, binding legal code of conduct, if you will. So let me throw out one other issue that sort of keeps me up at night, and that is if we're spending all of this money and if we have cyber command and we've, we're making this major military approach to the possibility of cyber war and cyber attacks, can that be used as a way to erode our own civil liberties and privacy? And I know, Shannon, you've been thinking about this. What, what would you say? 
Well, yeah, I mean, this is a, a very big concern uh, because always you do have to balance security against other rights issues like privacy. But something that Peter mentioned earlier is really important for us to remember, and that is how easily you can hype these kinds of fears. And when you think about um, that uh, survey that Peter mentioned, where people are more afraid of a cyber attack mm -hmm. than they are of these very real urgent threats that we are not giving money towards or not, not giving enough attention and focus and resources to try to address, um, that's actually quite horrifying. And if you, if you put in front of people in very stark terms, this is how much money you are spending as a nation to prevent this cyber attack, which is in many ways not likely to happen and would be not even in the interests of the groups you're afraid of in the end of the day, uh, when you could spend that same amount of money and save this many lives if you put it towards cancer research or this much uh, benefit towards education and so forth, uh, you know, it would be very frustrating. And yet if you scare people enough, they will hand over their privacy incredibly easily. And, and I'll just add one other point, which is I think this is where the lack of transparency is also a bit terrifying for ordinary civilians, which is that we don't know exactly how much privacy we have already given up. All right. So we're almost out of time. I want to go back to Peter Singer, the author of the book Cybersecurity and Cyber War, What Everyone Needs to Know, and say, Peter, you've got the last word. Where do you think we're going to be in 10 years in terms of this issue? If we're having this broadcast 10 years from now, what are we talking about? Well, we'll probably be downloading it into our brains or something <laughs> like that. <laughs> um, uh, in all seriousness, the, the, the one word that I, would, that I hope will um, kind of end on at that point is resilience. And you can think about resilience in terms of the physiological or the psychological. The physiological is that I hope we have a approach to cybersecurity and what it means more broadly that goes beyond just thinking we can build up higher walls or we can deter the danger, we can scare it away. You know, your body expects that it's going to be in a dangerous world. And so it has layers of defenses and it, um, you know, does everything from isolates the attack to it has an internal monitoring system to it triages. You know, there's all different ways. And so we've got to move out of this mentality of just thinking that I can keep it out. Um, the more important maybe meaning of resilience is the psychological side. It's, uh, you know, you can think of the parallel in uh, the British approach to terrorism versus ours, you know, keep calm and carry on. Resilience <laughs> in a psychological way is, is saying, you know, I expect that there will be bad things in the world, but it's all about how I'm going to power through them. And if I get knocked down, how I'm going to get back up rapidly. And that's really where I hope uh, this shifts to. And so the, the bottom line here is that as long as we're using the internet, and 10 years from now we will be, we will face these threats, and so therefore we have to work to manage them well, and be more resilient about them. That's a, a great final note. On September 15th, Case Western Reserve University School of Law is going to be having a day-long symposium on this subject. And I invite you to join us live by coming to Case Western if you're in the Cleveland area, or you can tune in and listen to it and watch it by webcast anywhere in the world. Meanwhile, if you want to weigh in on the discussion that we've been having or suggest a topic for an upcoming broadcast, please send an email to talkingforeignpolicy at case.edu. I want to thank again our panel of experts, Peter Singer, author of Cybersecurity and Cyber War, What Everyone Needs to Know, Colonel Mike Newton from Vanderbilt University, Professor Melena Stereo from Cleveland Marshall College of Law, and Dr. Shannon French from the Inamori International Center for Ethics and Excellence at Case Western. I'm Michael Scharf. You've been listening to Talking Foreign Policy, produced by Case Western Reserve University and WCPN 90.3 IdeaStream. Talking Foreign Policy is a production of Case Western Reserve University and is produced in partnership with 90.3 FM WCPN Idea Stream. Questions and comments about the topics discussed on the show or to suggest future topics, go to talkingforeignpolicy at case.edu. That's talkingforeignpolicy, all one word, at case.edu.